the last five weeks close have been about closing the gap between where our spiritual lives are to as they are as to where we hope our spiritual lives might be for the better or even better as God wants our spiritual lives to be. These practices that we've been examining over the last couple of weeks might be called by some as spiritual practices that have sustained and been practiced by Christians since the earliest days of the good news to this present moment. Worship and daily prayer. Studying and listening for God around us as well as speaking to us through scripture. Serving others with acts of justice and kindness. Giving generously toward God and others. And sharing always our faith through the deeds as well as through our words. Worship and prayer, studying, serving, and giving. These are the five practices that we actually expect also to be performed and done by our members of Prairie Avenue. Today is Palm Sunday, but the shadow of the cross is here as well. And today our scripture readings were from the seven words of the cross that Jesus spoke while he was crucified. Now, Jesus was tried and convicted of insurrection, of treason against the state by the governor, Pontius Pilate. He went on to be beaten and taunted and condemned and led to die by Roman soldiers. He was forced to carry the patabulum the part where the hands would be nailed along a path that was later called the Via Della Rosa, the way of suffering. And he carried that board to a rock outcropping just outside of the gates of Jerusalem called Golgotha or Calvary. And it was there on that rock outcropping that the cross was assembled and Jesus was stripped naked and then his wrists were nailed. And then each of his feet were nailed to each side as they hoisted the cross into place. Now, unlike many paintings of the crucifixion, Jesus likely was not 10 feet in the air, but more closely to the ground, about two to three feet. And he was crucified there with two other insurrectionists, two other rebellion leaders nearby. The act of crucifixion of Jesus began about nine in the morning until, as scriptures recorded, he breathed his last around 3 p.m. on that Good Friday. Now, it's been debated among scholars and doctors and other people, how crucifixion actually kills its victims. But likely the act of crucifixion included the victims suffering from shock, the loss of blood, and asphyxiation due to the buildup of fluids around the heart and lungs. For Jesus, it would have become increasingly difficult to breathe or to talk as the time passed that Good Friday. In order to speak or to breathe, the victim would have to pull himself up with, by the very nails that were piercing his wrists in order to breathe or speak. So it is remarkable that in the Gospels we hear Jesus speak seven times from the cross. Now the Gospels of Mark and Matthew only mention one of these responses, and then Jesus giving a loud shout at the moment of death. The Gospel of Luke records three other sayings, 
and the Gospel of John, likely the last of the Gospels, records three different sayings from the cross. Both Matthew and Mark have the same phrase Jesus uttered, crying out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was actually quoting scripture here. He was quoting from Psalm 22, verse 1. And this will be the first of three prayers that Jesus would speak from the cross. Now, throughout Jesus' ministry, prayer is mentioned often. Whether Jesus' habit of withdrawing early in the morning to some secluded place to pray, or Jesus praying at meals just before eating, or Jesus praying on the mountaintop, or Jesus praying in the boat, and also Jesus praying even for his enemies, as he will do yet this day. Jesus' cry of, my God, my God, has for, how, how have you forsaken me, represents that time when we feel abandoned by God. And it's good for us to hear that even Jesus experienced a time in his life where evil simply appeared to be totally victorious and where God seemed conspicuously absent. In our own lives, there are those times we experience when God's will seems truly absent from us and when evil people do evil things that we cry out in anguish that God should have stopped it from happening. But life teaches us that God often doesn't intervene in such a direct way. It may not be stopped while it's happening. But anything, anything can be redeemed and overcome. So in the midst of this cruelty, this inhumanity of crucifixion that Jesus is experiencing, Jesus yet prayed. In times of crisis and despair, we too should pray. We should address God as we do with our worship. And we should pray in all times and in all seasons. Now, the second of Jesus's three prayers he's going to say on Good Friday is when Jesus spoke again, drawing from scripture. Any reader of the Gospels will realize quickly how often Jesus quotes scripture. When Jesus is tempted by the devil, Jesus doesn't respond with miraculous powers and signs of his authority, but rather he quotes scripture as a response to the temptations. And what Jesus prayed was, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Now, the 20th century biblical scholar William Barclay noted that this, which is another psalm quotation, it's actually from Psalms 31, was a bedtime prayer that Jewish mothers taught to their children to say, each night, not too unfamiliar to our practice of saying the prayer, now I lay me down to sleep. Now the word that is translated here as I commit my spirit means to entrust someone to someone for safekeeping. I like the thought and idea that not only at Nighttime, but whenever we are afraid and unsure about what to do, that first of all, we come back to Scripture as Jesus pulled Scripture in the agony of the cross. And he prayed the prayer, perhaps that his own mother Mary taught him. Into your hands, 
I commit my spirit. Now in the days just before arriving in Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, Jesus spoke these words, the Son of Man, which is often how he referred to himself, came here not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. At the cross, and the Gospel of John records this, Jesus is speaking tenderly to one of the few disciples present at the crucifixion, the beloved one, as he's referred to in the Gospel of John. And tradition tells us that it was indeed John as a disciple. And Jesus said to his mother, who was there in the agony of the crucifixion, Woman, behold your son. And then turning to his disciple, John, he said, Behold your mother. John, here is your mother now. This treatment of our parents should remind us of the fifth commandment of the ten in the Old Testament, to honor your mother and father. Interestingly enough, this tenth commandment is the one that actually gives us a promise with it, that your days may be long. But see, John is not the son of Mary at this moment. But Jesus is commanding John to take care of his mother, to take her home, to treat Mary as if she was his own mother. How oftentimes are we called to serve people as if they were our own loved ones, as if they were our own parents? Are there elderly neighbors who need assistance nearby? Are there those who are not family in the strictest biological sense, but are those people who could be your mother or father? Oh, it's amazing. And it's a reminder for us that Jesus calls us to treat parents, whatever they are, and to serve them with honor and respect. Now, maybe a little strange that Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many, as we are reminded that the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be served and to give his life as a ransom for many. And the next phrase that Jesus utters from the cross might sound a little bit more selfish than selfless. He speaks of a request, common at the moments of death or near to it. I thirst. Now, for those who have experienced death intimately, it's not too uncommon that right towards the end of life, the person can't speak and is comforted by ice chips being placed near their mouth so that they can draw. They can't swallow anymore, but they can get refreshment from a little water. Now, it might be strange for John to mention this, but the one thing about the Gospel of John we should always remember is that John doesn't mention casual things casually. There's a deeper meaning going on with Jesus' request, I thirst. You see, it's in the Gospel of John that we encounter the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus is sitting next to the well and his disciples have gone to find food and he catches a Samaritan woman. Now there was great enmity between Jews and Samaritans, so much so that they created routes to avoid one another between Galilee and Jerusalem. And it's revealed to us quickly that this woman has a past 
several past marriages in, in her life. And her coming at noon is far later than the typical time to draw water. But Jesus, a Jew, requests the Samaritan woman to give him a drink. And it was at that moment that the woman was surprised and shocked that you shouldn't be asking me this. Jews and Samaritans don't get along. And Jesus then tells her, if you knew who was asking you to draw water, you would ask and you would receive the living water and never thirst again. What is this living water? It's a life of purpose. It's a life of meaning. It's a life of hope. It's a life of grace. And now on the cross, the one who offers, the one who generously gives living water is now thirsty. He's given it all. He's given all the living water, and has truly poured himself out to give all of us eternal life. I don't know of any higher expression of generosity than giving the totality of your life, everything you have for others. Perhaps it should not be surprising that we gain an expression of how much God loves us in the actual physical appearance of Jesus on the cross with those outstretched arms. God reveals how much he loves us, how much God loves you. With outstretched arms, this, this is the length to which I will come and go to save you. Now often in Jesus' ministry, he was criticized for associating with the wrong crowd. With tax collectors, with sinners, with prostitutes, with all the people that the religious authorities thought unworthy of Jesus's gospel or even God's attention. He spends a lot of time, a lot of time, seeking the lost, telling stories of the lost, whether it's the lost coin, the lost sheep, 99 are kept, one is missing, and this is to the lengths that God will go, seeking the one missing from the 99. And so it's telling and surprising to us, perhaps, that Jesus, in the lostness of the world that he was encountering, offers his third and final prayer. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. From the cross, still seeking the lost, still sharing God's good news, asking on the behalf of not himself, but on behalf of others, those Roman soldiers who are gambling his clothes away as he speaks this prayer, the same Roman soldiers who probably tortured him and abused him all the way from Pilate's court to Calvary. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do to the Jewish leaders whose jealousy and insecurity made them react with charges of blasphemy and setting up the trial of treason to have him killed, to even ask for their forgiveness for their behalf. 
It's not hard to see Jesus looking beyond those around him, beyond the crowds that mock him, and into our own lives. Forgiving us for the things that we do not know we are doing. Forgiving us for our infidelities. Forgiving us for our weaknesses, for our addictions, for our failures to love. This God forgives us, for we know not what we are doing. This forgiveness offered by Jesus has an immediate effect. One of the bandits, now one of the bandits is ridiculing him, but the other bandit, the one that was probably quiet while being slowly tortured to death on his own cross, was impressed by the plea. And simply said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remembrance is important in scripture. That which is remembered can be redeemed. And Jesus lovingly, this lost soul, this last person, this lost sheep, even in the agony of his cross, gives the promise of eternal life. Today, you will be with me in paradise. We come to the last phrase that Jesus is said to have uttered. And in our English translation, it is, it is finished. But in the Greek, it's actually just one word. To telestai. To telestai has an interesting meaning. It can mean finished, which we often think is done. But it also means so much more. Completed, fulfilled. Will Willimon, a prominent Methodist bishop, compares the thought of teletestinali as this feeling that Michelangelo may have had when he finished the Sistine Chapel. At last and forever, it is accomplished. So the agony of the cross, the torture, the earnest prayers of Jesus are finished. It's fulfilled. It's done. It is accomplished. Now, it is finished may sound to us like a failure. But Jesus saying teletesli means it is a victory. This agonizing evil act, the worst that humanity could ever do to God, is yet redemption. Is yet the ransom, the price paid for us. So what lessons do we gain from the seven words of the cross, the seven sayings of the cross? What does that instruct us on these five practices of worship and prayer, studying scripture? serving others with acts of kindness, giving ourselves generously toward God and others, and sharing our faith. I think Jesus illustrated each and every one of those practices for us. First of all, Jesus prayed at least three times while in the agony of crucifixion. Is it too much for us to ask ourselves, can we pray in the morning? 
Can we find a little quiet time to go and pray? Can we pray before meals? Can we pray before we do our work? And can we pray just before we go to bed? Into your hands I commit my spirit. Such a simple prayer. Such a profound prayer. We know that Jesus often recited scripture. Besides the Psalms, he quoted Deuteronomy. Would it be too much for us to engage scripture in a more wholesome manner, in a more direct manner, in a more consistent manner? If Jesus knew and could quote scripture from his memory, who's to say that we cannot do the same? I think many of Jesus' stories illustrate that he demonstrated service to God and to others, whether it was feeding the 5,000, healing the lame, curing the sick. Now, mind you, we may not have these healthy properties, these healing powers that Jesus possessed, but we do know that kindness and acts of justice can change a person's life. Are we willing? to demonstrate the love of God through service. I think no greater love was expressed than on the cross. How much does God love us this much? He didn't withhold anything for our sake. We should be at least feeling that we need to give something back in return. That perhaps what we should give is ourselves fully rather than whatever we can spare. And finally, he drew all people. Most of the time, the people who were rejected by the very religious organizations that existed in Jesus' time and place, the ones who felt unworthy, the ones who felt too sinful, the ones who were betrayed by the world and often condemned by religious leaders. Jesus drew the lost to be found as God chooses to draw the lost and found each and every day, sharing the good news of unrelenting love. Can we share that unrelenting love that God has already shared for us? Because we are blessed, not because we are good. We are blessed so that we may become a blessing for others. So this Holy Week, I want you to reflect on these practices from the cross. To worship and pray to study scripture, to listen for God around us, for serving others through acts of justice and kindness, and giving generously towards God and others, and sharing the unrelenting love that God has for the lost, the lost that we are called to seek and to find. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for loving me more than I will ever comprehend. 
Thank you for sending Jesus to receive me when I was lost. I accept your love, your forgiveness, and your grace. Help me as I seek to work with you, my crucified King. In your holy name, I pray. Amen.